Our last speaker for the day is Pierre Baldi. Um, <clears throat> Pierre did his PhD at Berkeley in 1990. Caltech. Oh, I mean, at Caltech in 86. In 86. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, my, okay. I my info stop. is. Uh, uh, he did a postdoc at UCSD. Is that right? And then was at Caltech for many years before uh, a startup, and then eventually joining us here at UC Irvine in 1999, I think. Thank you. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about natural sciences. So let me ask you, when did natural sciences start? Uh, Any guesses? Pietro. Natural science. 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago. I think it's a little bit more recent, after the Renaissance. And since 40% uh, of the speakers are Italian, including myself, I think. <laughs> I will say that it started with Galileo Galilei, this man who uh, heroically built uh, the, one of the first telescopes, which had a magnification factor of 20, which he used to look at the planets and uh, noted that the Earth was moving, was not static at the center of the universe. And to thank him for these discoveries, the Pope put him in jail or under house arrest. But uh, Galileo didn't have a computer, had to do everything by hand, no iPhone, very tough times. You can see he's not very happy on this picture. <laughs> now, he couldn't order the telescope on Amazon. Now, what has changed? Absolutely nothing. You still cannot order the telescope on Amazon, but you have now the Hubble telescope in space, and of course, it's producing uh, petabytes of data. And now you do need computers to store the data and to analyze the data. And this is true in, uh, in astronomy, but of course you have similar things across all the natural sciences. So you need statistics, machine learning to analyze these uh, large amounts of data. When did machine learning start? This morning I heard 70s, 60s, etc., 50s, McCulloch and Pitts, but this is nonsense. I think machine learning started a little bit earlier when the Gauss and others, for the first time, derived the equations for uh, linear regression. You have a set of points, you want to make a model, you try lines, etc. and every question about machine learning is inside this picture, you know. How do you fit the model to the line? Are there alternative models? How you do prediction on new points, etc., etc. And I would argue that uh, what we do today is pretty much the same thing, a little bit on steroids, because we're not f always dealing with the lines in two dimensions, but we are dealing with uh, higher dimensional spaces and, of course, uh, nonlinear problems. And so we're fitting, very often we're trying to fit um, highly nonlinear surfaces in, in spaces that have 100 to, to a million uh, dimensions. And that's where deep, nets, uh, um, deep learning has been uh, very successful. For this audience, I'm not going to say any, any, anything in details about convolutional networks and, and uh, performance on ImageNet. You're all very familiar with that. But the point I want to make is that these techniques have been applied to a lot of areas in engineering, whether it's computer vision, robotics, uh, speech recognition, NLP, et cetera. And what I'm going to show you are different sets of applications in the natural sciences, in physics, in chemistry, and biology. Let me say a few things about theory before I go that, in that direction. If you want to make a theory of deep learning, you first have to start with shallow learning, one layer. If you have one layer, all the units are independent from each other. And then, depending on the type of units, you get linear regression, logistic regression, etc. So that's very well understood what happens in a shallow network. And then deep network starts when you have two, two layers. In fact, there is one step before is when you have two layers, but one layer is fixed. The bottom layer is fixed. You learn the top layer. There are interesting subcases of that. One is so-called a, a extreme learning machine. Or that's a little bit what was also in, in Feisha's talk, where the bottom layer is random. So you get uh, a random projection of the data. And there is a lot of theorems about random projections followed by learning the top layer. Or you could fix the weights in the lower layer to be your training examples, and that's exactly what you have in SVMs. The learning algorithm is not gradient descent, but, but in terms of structure, that's exactly what SVMs are. So deep learning begins with two layers. In fact, you could have the, f the top layer fixed and learn the lower layer, 
that's already deep learning. And that case is not, uh, is not much simpler than if you leave the two layers free. So let's go directly to that case. And to simplify things a little bit, let's make the output equal to the input. That's called an autoencoder. You can show that it's about as, if you can solve the autoencoder case, you have solved the general case. And so we need to understand autoencoders, and that's one of the reasons why I think they are very important. And you have two types, compressive, when the hidden layer is, is uh, more narrow than the input layer, or expansive. Uh, if you look at the compressive autoencoders, you can solve the linear case. We solved it in 1988. That's uh, what, uh, what uh, Anima was also uh, um, mentioning in her talk. And of course it does PCA, but that's not the most interesting things about that. The, what, what is interesting is the landscape of the linear compressive autoencoder, which looks like that. Of course, this, you have to think about these, these points as manifolds. But the, the key point is that there is one global minimum corresponding to PCA, and then there's lots of subtle points. There is no true local minima in this problem. There is an exponential number of subtle points where the gradient is zero associated with projection onto different subsets of, of uh, eigenvectors um, of, of the, of the uh, covariance matrix of, of, of the data. And, and this picture is actually um, a good representation of what we see today in the, in the general case in the sense that in, in high dimensions, even in the nonlinear case, it's very rare that you find local, true local minima because the gradient has to be zero in all directions, the derivative has to be zero in all directions. In addition, you have to go up in all possible directions. So that's a fairly rare event in a one million dimensional space. On the other hand, subtle points are much more common, and those are a problem when you're doing gradient descent to some extent. And even in the linear case, nobody thinks of doing gradient descent here because you can go directly there analytically. But it's actually interesting, and you get all kinds of interesting effects where you can get stuck in plateaus. And you also see that you don't need, depending on your objective, in the linear case, you, you can understand all the jumps between these this, uh, subtle points, how they relate to the eigenvalues of, of the covariance matrix. And so you can see that. Uh, you don't have to get to the uh, global minimum to have good performance, right? Any subtle points below a certain level will be enough if, if for, for a given level of performance. And that's also what you see in, in, uh, in uh, deep nonlinear networks. Uh, that's the linear case. You want to do a nonlinear compressive autoencoders. You have the only case that has been solved that I know of is the Boolean case. In the Boolean unrestricted case, you get clustering for the Hamming distance, it's NP complete, et cetera. You combine these two together, you start understanding what happens if you put sigmoidal neural networks at the beginning of, le of learning, everything is linear, you do PCA. As, as learning progresses, you go towards the flat parts of the sigmoidal functions, you start doing clustering in the PCA uh, space. Um, expansive hour encoders are a different stories. They are very, also very interesting. That's where sparsity comes in, but I, I won't say um, uh, much about them here. Um, you can then start thinking about what happens when you go beyond two layers. I, I won't say anything, but I want to say two things about the optimality of backpropagation, and I will say something about recurrent networks, which will be important for the applications. So backpropagation is optimal, and in some partial way answers the, qu answer one of the second question that Tommy had this morning. I'm going to show you that in some sense backpropagation uh, is optimal um, in the following way. So imagine you have a deep feed forward network that you're trying to train, and you want to find optimal weights where the gradient, the derivative of the error is zero. So imagine you're training this layer. If you write the critical equations, you write that the gradient is equal to zero, you're going to get some over all training example of something that is the product of the, the activity of these neurons times the backpropagated error. And so in that equation, when you solve it for the optimal weights in, the, in, the, in this layer, the weights have to depend not only on the input, of course, but also on the targets. And in fact, on, on all the weights that are above, above it, right? So if you want to find optimal weights, you have to propagate information about the targets and all the weights above back to this layer. There is no other way. So there has to be a channel that conveys this information, let's say information about the target, back down to the weights if you want to get to an optimal point. 
So you, in, a, in a physical implementation, it's very interesting to think about what the channel could be, etc. You can think about the biology. But regardless, if there is such a channel, we can think about the capacity of the channel. And by capacity, I mean how many bits are you sending back from the targets to the deep weights, and how, how many operations do you need to do that? And there are many other algorithms besides backpropagation you could think of. For instance, you could apply the definition of derivatives, right? Perturb a, a, a weight by epsilon, look at the effect on the error, and then takes the difference divided by the perturbation. That's another way of computing derivatives, right? And you can think about many other algorithms, but to make a long story short, you can see that backpropagation is optimal because if you look at the number of bits it sends back per weight, let's say that you are in double precision, so you're sending d bits back, okay, above the gradient. In a high dimensional space, you don't worry about the S and et cetera, it sends n square, we, we, we cannot even go there. So backpropagation gives you the full information about the gradient, and the number of operation it takes is about one per weight, if you think about it. And all the other, other algorithms you, that are known, that I can think of, they are completely down here in this, in, in this lower part of this, of this, uh, this uh, two-dimensional plot. So backpropagation sits here. It's optimal both in terms of the number of bits and the number of operation it takes to send the information back. And so it's unlikely that you can do uh, much better than that up to the constants, etc. cetera. Um, the other point I want to make is that, uh, you know, people complain about uh, deep learning being black box and, and that's fair enough and you can do neurophysiology on deep networks, but uh, some, some amount of opacity is inevitable because you are fitting this uh, high-dimensional surface, let's say one million variable in, in a nonlinear uh, surface, that process has to be opaque. We're not used with our visual system to see or to understand uh, nonlinear surfaces in one million dimensions, right? Furthermore, you have to understand that neural networks are completely diff a di completely different style of computation from what you have in your computer. In your computer, you store your training set as different, different addresses. You have your, your, your input and your target. A neural network is training, the, it takes the training, s the, the, the training set and shatters it entirely across all the weights. Every weight in, the neural, in, a, in a neural network has a little trace of every training example. And that process has to be opaque. All right, so let me uh, now say one last thing about theoretical things, which has to do uh, with the design of recurrent networks for applications. Then I'll move to applications. So in applications, you have two kinds of problems. One, where you have inputs of fixed size, for instance, images, or maybe you have 100 sensors and all the inputs are vectors of size 100, your 100 measurements. And then other problems where the input is highly variable in size and in structure. So this could be molecules, it could be uh, sequences, it could be text in natural language processing. You could have trees, parse trees, phylogenetic trees, et cetera. So in these problems where the size is variable and where there is structure, you have to use, it's, it's not natural to use feed-forward networks. It's not, it's not the, 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 the right structure. So those are the problems where you have to use uh, recurrent uh, rec uh, recursive networks. And I'm going to argue that you have basically two different families of approaches for designing these networks, which then I will illustrate on some of the problems. And these two approaches are the inner approach and the outer approach. So the inner approach is, is an approach where you take your data, you need to have a directed acyclic graph, and basically you use neural networks to crawl, it, to crawl the edges of this graph. So you are inside the graph. The outer approach builds neural networks in a direction orthogonal to your input graphs, to your data graphs, in a different, in a, in a different direction. And, you, and tries in essentially to fold the initial graph in order to obtain the final answers. Final answer. This sounds a little bit uh, strange maybe for some of you, but let me illustrate on a simple example. So imagine you are dealing with sequences. A standard uh, model for sequences would be an HMM. As a directed acyclic graph, as a, as a Bayesian network, an HMM would look like this. You can uh, rewrite this using neural networks, in fact. You can put a neural network here for the transition between the hidden states and a neural network here for the production of the, uh, of the output. 
and you can do weight sharing across all these uh, production edges as well as weight sharing along all the uh, transition edges. So this, this system can be rewritten in terms of two recursive neural networks and, and, and that can be used to, to model the sequences. Uh, so that's the inner approach because I'm building my neural networks inside the graph, my data graph here, the HMM, and using that to produce whatever prediction or, uh, I'm, I'm interested in. If you want to do an outer approach on a sequence problem, you have your sequence here and you're building networks, neural networks in the other direction. So you have in the first layer maybe neural networks that are looking at a certain window of the sequence, et cetera. You can do weight sharing horizontally in this layer and then repeat the operation at different layers so that the higher layers are capable of looking at uh, you know, long, longer, longer dependencies in your initial sequences. So in the application, we'll do the same thing, but say for molecules or for other objects. So let me start with applications in physics. There are tons of interesting uh, problems where, where de deep learning could be applied in physics from the very small scale, subatomic scale, to the very uh, large scale. And what is very interesting to me is that you know, some problems, the two scales come together. For instance, the problem of dark matter we know that 85% of the universe is made of dark matter and we have no idea of what dark matter is. We don't know what the particles are of dark matter, etc. You detect it by its uh, gravitational effect, but you can try to study dark matter not only at the cosmological scale, but at the subatomical scale by smashing particles in, in colliders and trying to, to produce dark matter in, the, in those collisions. So that's the, the uh, CERN. In uh, Switzerland, you have this collider, which is a very complex instrument that Galileo could not have uh, dreamt of, which is basically a, a very long tunnel, 17 miles, I think, or so, underground, 100 meter undergrounds. And in this tunnel, you can run protons at very high speed, close to the speed of light, and smash them together. And around the point of, uh, of collision, you have these uh, very complex detectors, which has itself 100 millions of elementary detectors uh, together, which are getting uh, signals from this, these collisions. And from that, you are trying to infer which particle were produced around the collision point, et cetera, et cetera. And these collisions occur very, very fast on a s nanosecond scale. And so th this instrument uh, literally produces one petabyte of, of data per second. Most of it has, been, has to be thrown away, by the way, because you cannot store uh, data that comes at you at, at one petabyte per second. This is just a, 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 another schematic view of the collider, which has different parts, different you know, sub, subsystem. I won't go into the details, but there is the muon detector here. There is the tracker. There is the calorimeter, et cetera. Uh, if you, again, you can see the scale of this system. Your favorite presidential candidate is sitting here, Donald Trump. And uh, that, that's the kind of uh, objects that we're uh, interested in. And I'll show you uh, examples of, uh, of the applications of deep learning to the signals uh, that, that, that you obtain in, in, this, uh, in these detectors. So this example, the first three examples are what you get at the level of the calor calorimeter, which is um, you know, s not at the beginning of the processing of the collision, but, but further down, where basically what you're getting are the momenta of the various particles at the collision. And from this momenta, so this is a vector of fixed size that you get at the level of the calorimeter, these first three uh, um, examples. And from this vector of fixed size, which uh, sizes, which, which has the information about the momenta, you want to do a classification. Was a Higgs boson produced in that collision or not, for example? Or was a supersymmetric particle produced or not, et cetera, right? There is tons of, of pro classification problems like that. You can go one step before the calorimeter, so there is a, 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 a subsystem called the tracker, where the data really is in form of jets or tracks of particles along a cylinder, and so there, is, there are problems at that level where you want to, do, to, to classify uh, those jets and their substructures, et cetera. So that's where you get data in general that has a variable size because in a collision you can have a different number of tracks, different number of vertices, and so your input 
is, is a, a, a set of vectors that has, that has a variable, uh, variable size. So let me uh, show you what we do on problems like the, the first three problems. This is the calorimeter. It's fixed size, so we just run uh, standard feed-forward uh, neural networks in this case. Uh, sometimes we have, in addition to the row features, the moment of the particle, we have high-level features uh, uh, that are uh, used by physicists, which are just you know, mathematical formulas that you can apply. And you can use the row, the row features or the human-derived features. You can combine, etc., in the classification. We have very good simulators for the corresponding collisions. So these are Feynman diagrams. For instance, in the case of the production of the Higgs boson versus the background, these are the simulators that physicists have built that you can use to, to produce uh, additional data. And so in this particular example, we, uh, we had a, a training set with over uh, 10 million examples. Uh, this is the um, histogram of some of the features all little details that are uh, relatively uninteresting. This is uh, the details of uh, one of the best architecture we found in terms of layers and learning rates, etc. But bottom line, at the end of the day, this is what, uh, what matters is that by using these deep learning methods, we're able to improve the AUC by 8% over the previous methods that the physicists were using, including uh, things like BDT, boosted decision trees. They, they draw the ROC curves the other way around, but it's, it's really uh, an ROC curves. So you can see in this case, for instance, the deep neural networks uh, with the high level feature, without the high level features, they do about the same. So we're able to get rid of the, in this particular example, of the high level features that the physicists like to use, and then the performance of uh, several other algorithms. So we've done this a few times. We have done also compression of these uh, uh, neural networks into shallow neural networks to, to speed them up using some a trick called dark knowledge, which is uh, now well known. You basically train a deep neural network for classification, for example, and then you use the analog values of the deep neural networks as the target for training a shallow neural network. The idea being that the analog values of the deep network contain additional knowledge, so-called dark knowledge, that is not present in the binary labels or of, your, of your training data. There is really no reason to do it for the networks I, I showed you, either than for having a paper with a title that combines dark knowledge with dark matter. But, but, <laughs> but, uh, again, there are several steps in these very complex detectors. I, sh I showed you some example here uh, in the calorimeter. We're now working on the tracker where you have this variable size uh, set data, but there is something called the trigger, which is where really at the beginning, where most of the data is thrown away and there is room for applying machine learning methods and they have to be very fast, of course, because of the speed at which this data is produced, but, but there is pos potential for having compressed neural networks there also. And there are other problems in the muon, muon detector. I'm not going to go there, but uh, so lots of things that can be done there and of course, there are other problems in, in cosmology, in astronomy. You want to, for instance, recognize galaxies versus quasars. You want to we have a student working on detecting quench galaxies, the quenching of galaxies. Some galaxies are still producing stars. Some, some, some galaxies have stopped producing stars. You want to detect this from, from their images. So a lo lot of opportunities there. Let me switch rapidly to chemistry. You can look at small molecules in organic chemistries. These are example, the 20 natural uh, amino acids. So these are molecules that have, let's say, less than 50 atoms, mostly organic, so carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Of course, you can have some, some sulfur, some bromine, some other things there, but by and large, uh, th those are the components. And the first question is, how big is the space of small molecules? Well, if you go into the existing databases, and you look at all the molecules that have been synthesized or, or that we have recognized in biological systems, you get something on the order of 50 million different small molecules. But of course, there is a virtual space of all the small molecules that could be made, and that's really astronomical. Estimates are on, in the range of 10 to the 60, but this number, you know, I could put 10 to the 70 and 
nobody would complain. It's just, it's bigger than the total number of atoms in the universe, etc. So there is very large number of, of virtual molecules that chemists could synthesize if you, if you chose one and you say, I really need to make that one, you know, chemists probably can make it. The, the problem is to travel this space and to identify molecules that are interesting, say as drugs or, or, or for other applications. So as a very small step in that direction, you want to develop th things that can look at molecules and predict their properties, physical, chemical, biological. You know, is this molecule soluble in water? What happens if I eat it? Is it toxic? Will, will it make me euphoric, etc. right? So you need training sets and you need representations. Good news. Molecules, we have very different, many ways of representing them, so you can play with whichever techniques you, li you like. You're familiar with these graphs. Of course, they have 3D structures, so I could give you X, Y, Z coordinates of all the atoms. There is a language, if you like, a text called SMILES that allows you to represent molecules. It's very easy to learn. And then there are fingerprints, which are fixed length vectors of zero and one, where the ones tells you whether a certain substructure is present or not in the molecule. So, you can apply feed-forward networks to this, uh, or you can use you know, recursive networks on some of the other uh, representations. We heard um, about uh, um, uh, uh, sh short long-term memory um, units, for instance, you could try to apply those techniques to smile strings. I'm going to show you an application of the inner approach to uh, the graph of the molecules. Now remember, for the inner approach, you need a DAG. You need the graph to be directed acyclic, and these graphs sometimes have cycles, but mo even more so, they are not, there is no nat natural way of orienting the edges of such a molecule. So what we do, actually, we take all possible orientations. So you see a molecule here. We, in, you, we take as many uh, copies as we need, and then we choose in each copy a different node, and we orient all the edges towards the no that node. So you can show in that way that you get uh, all, kind, all possible, essentially all possible uh, directed uh, acyclic orientations. And then we have neural networks that are crawling each one of these molecules along the directed edges. So each neural network basically uh, takes as input vectors associated with the vertices that contain information about the atom type, etc., produce an output, and then it's fed to the next level, etc. You can collect all these results from all these ne networks here and then pass them in a final uh, multi-layer network that produces the prediction in this case of whether the molecule is soluble or not. All this is uh, because the graphs are acyclic, you can backpropagate from the top all the way down in all these networks. And of course, the, the networks that are crawling all these molecules are shared, so you keep the number of parameters uh, very reasonable. And that works well. If you think about the outer approach, you want to see how is the outer approach on molecule. The, the molecules, there was, was a paper at the last NIPS doing exactly that from, from a group at Harvard. Here's a molecule. You're just going to stack neural networks on top in the other direction, perpendicular to the molecule. So you have a neural network here that may look at this node, plus maybe the two neighbors, and uh, looking at the fact that these are all carbons and passing the information to some output, etc. And you can iterate this over uh, several layers and at the top again produce a prediction of solubility or toxicity or whatever you're interested in and, and backpropagate. Second class of important problems in chemistry is the prediction of uh, chemical reactions, things like this. You can try to approach this problem in different ways. You can try quantum mechanics. It doesn't work at all if you want to do things in a high throughput mode. It's way too slow and, and brittle. You can try to write a system of rules by hand I'll show you how it looks like, but it's very tedious and not very scalable. You could try to learn the rules in the same way you learn a, a grammar, or you can try to, to do a, 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 a one other approach that I'll show you using deep learning. So writing rules, which there is a language called Smirks that allow you to um, write uh, down reactions. It's very much like the smiles uh, language that I showed you before. It's a variation on the smile language. These numbers that you see are just atom uh, numbering. So you want to try, if you have a carbon number one on the left, you want to track it on the, on the, on the right. So um, together with Jonathan Chen, we built a system called Reaction Explorer that has 800 uh, rules that works uh, reasonably well for covering undergraduate chemistry. 
and it has been turned into an interactive uh, system for education which is uh, distributed by, by Wiley. So that works well, but it covers only undergraduate chemistry and it's, very, uh, it's not scalable because these are the set, for instance, of reactions that you have to write down to cover all the cases of a particular class, small class of reactions. It's, it's not very um, readable for humans to begin with. And then every time you add a new rule, you have to check that it doesn't break any of the previous rule. And so it's, it's, very, it's impossible to, to really scale it up without some tricks. So what's uh, the alternative that we're uh, using now? It's to look at the way chemists think about reactions. So this is a reaction, it's called uh, the hydrobromination of an alkene. An alkene is a, a, a small molecule with a double bond that is uh, here. This is uh, HBr, which reacts with this molecule and, and produces this uh, product, right? The way, if you, if you ask chemists, you know, well, how this reaction happens, well, they will tell you that first uh, HBr gives you H plus Br minus, and then the bromine attacks the double bond and you get this. But the, at the end of the day, bottom line is that a reaction like this is a sequence of elementary reactions, and each elementary reaction is just the movement of an electron from a source to a sink. So obviously what we're going to do is to look at the reactants in a reaction, find all the sources, find all the sinks, and then we pair them. The problem is that you're going, if you have 10 sources and 10 sinks, you're going to have, get 100 pairs, and then you have a ranking problem. But that's exactly what search engine do, right? So we can use machine learning to do the ranking. For that, we use a Siamese network where we enter sourcing pairs on the right, sourcing pair on the left, and the network has to choose left or, or right, which one is more favorable, and we train the system and the um, new system is called Reaction Predictor, and it's working quite well, not yet at the level of, of a human expert, but we, we, we keep training it, and hopefully in time it's going to, to get better and better. So uh, applications in biology, there are tons of them. This is the telescope for biology these days. It's a DNA sequencer. You can sequence your genome in, in one afternoon or less for $1,000 for or less and uh, you get something that looks like that. You could run deep networks to try to predict the effect of mutations and all kinds of things. The problems we, we have worked on for quite a long time is the problem of predicting the structure of proteins, which is a complicated and messy uh, problem. It has many, many sub-problems. You can predict secondary structure. Where are the alpha helices, the strands, the coils in the structure, for instance? You can predict the, the 3D structure of the backbone, of the side chains, etc. The key issue is that the structure of the protein is invariant under translation and rotation. So you have to factor that in your pipeline. So the way we do it, we start from the sequence, we predict the secondary structure and a few other features that are found along the sequence. And that there is a key step, which is the prediction of the contact map which is a representation of the 3D structure that doesn't depend on rotation and translation. And basically, it's a matrix of 0 and 1s. And you put a 1 in position i, j, if and only uh, if amino acid i and j in the sequence are close to each other in, in the 3D structure. If you have a correct contact map, it's relatively easy to derive the 3D coordinates of the protein up to uh, mirror images. So the third step is solved. If we look at the first step, that's prediction of secondary structure. Again, we can use recursive neural networks. You can think of it as a translation problem. This is the representation in terms of an input-output HMM. In fact, input-output bidirectional HMM, if you like uh, graphical models. If you refactor this with recursive neural networks, you get three neural networks, one for the output, one for the backward hidden variable, and one for the forward hidden variable. If you unfold it in space or in time, this is how it looks like. These are the networks for the forward propagations. These are for the networks for the outputs, for the backward propagations, etc. You train these, and this is how performance has been improving over time on secondary structure prediction. Some of the initial work was done by Chu and Fassmann, 60% accuracy in the, in, uh, in, uh, in the 70s. Uh, Kian and Sinowski were the first to apply a, a neural network to this problem. They got 64 percent. 
in, in, in the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. And today's we're about 95% correct prediction on secondary structure, which means the, the, that problem, that particular problem is essentially solved because we know you cannot get to 100% for all kinds of reasons that, that uh, I, I don't have time to go into. But the first, so the first step of the pipeline is a solved. The last step of the pipeline is solved. Really the big prob remaining problem still open is the prediction of contact maps. We are again using uh, the same approach using recursive networks, this time in two dimensions. So it looks something like this. You have an input plane, four hidden planes, and an output plane. The output at position i, j should be the probability that there is a contact between position i and j. And if you look at one column in that gigantic uh, Bayesian network, you have an output that depends on the four hidden vector in the four hidden planes below it. And on the input, if I go into one of the hidden plane, let's say the northeast or north northwest plane, hidden plane, uh, the vector at that position depends on the two neighbors on the nearest neighbors on, on the lattice and also on the input. You rewrite this as recursive neural networks. You get five recursive neural networks, one for the output, one for the hidden states. And so the output is a function parameterized by a neural network of the input and the four hidden states, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a fairly heavy system, but you can train it. And uh, I'll show you how it does. But that, that's the inner approach for the um, for doing contact map prediction. You can also do an outer approach, which means you think of your plane and you're growing neural networks per perpendicular to, to the plane. So you have a stack of neural networks trying to predict the, the contact map or trying to fold the protein in different stages if you want. You don't have targets of the, of the structure as it falls. We don't have move, many movies of proteins as they fall, but it doesn't matter because we have the final contact map in the PDB database. So we have final targets here we can backpropagate through the entire stack. Um, how well this method do? Well, the recent CASP uh, experiment, which is uh, one of the benchmark experiment for um, protein structure prediction, in the difficult contact map prediction category, deep learning uh, was doing quite well. The top two methods were uh, deep learning methods, the inner, uh, in particular, the, the, the inner approach. But I think you can do the same thing with, with the, yes, the same thing with, with the outer approach. But so that, that's the good news. The bad news is that the accuracy that you get is still uh, not sufficient for solving, you know, the structure of arbitrary proteins. The accuracy we are reaching now, this, this is an older result, but right now we have an accuracy of about 30% on, on, uh, on, on contacts. And of course, you would want that number uh, to go significantly up. Um, other applications that I don't have time to go through, um, I have a student working on circadian rhythm, so we get the expression levels of, of, uh, of one gene taken at multiple uh, points in time, let's say every four hours during the day, and you want to decide whether the gene is periodic, whether the level of expression of that gene is oscillating in a periodic way, and we're using uh, deep neural networks to do that. Uh, the interesting thing for this problem is that we can train it entirely on synthetic data. And that's something that uh, I've seen uh, happening uh, in a few other areas in machine learning where synthetic data becomes extremely useful. So you just generate all kinds of different signals and then you sample them every two hours or every four hours and you get these data sets with millions of examples that you can use to train the systems. Of course, we also have biological data and we can test them on biological data and see how well they are at, at uh, um, you know, understanding whether a gene is, is behaving in a periodic way. And of course, we can extract the period, the phase, the amplitude, and all those things. And these are just ROC curves comparing this method to, to other methods. Um, I did make a contrast between engineering applications and natural sciences, but of course, there is no boundary. And uh, we have problems in biology and in, in, in medicine where we're using you know, feed-forward net, convolutional neural network for computer vision. This is a problem where we're looking at uh, X-ray images of the breast, mammograms, where 
where the goal, the primary goal is to detect whether there is cancer or not. But in fact, in these images, you also get a, a sense of the vasculature in the breast, and you get a sense of uh, the degree of calcification of, 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 uh, in the vasculature. And of course, if there is a high level of calcification, it is a sign of heart disease. So as a byproduct, if we could automate this analysis and predict how much calcification there is, we could uh, alert um, uh, patient who have a high degree of calcification and have them uh, undergo additional tests. And so we're using, uh, Zhuang Wang in my group is using uh, deep networks, trained on little patches of this image to detect the vessels and to um, you know, measure the degree of calcification and this is how well it is performing against uh, the expert and so far it's doing quite well. And uh, the next step for us is to increase our database of images. Another example of the same thing is a, is a high throughput uh, microfluiding system uh, developed here at UCI where you can uh, essentially grow vessels in little chambers and then these are uh, images taken from microscopes and you want for instance to be able to detect whether the uh, vasculature has a, has a healthy uh, conformation or not. And again, this can be done by, by neural network. This is uh, Kevin Bash in, in, in the group who is doing that. And in addition, in these little chambers, you can inject cancer cells. So the blue are cancer cells which are growing near the vessels typically. And you can inject drugs and monitor how this happens over time. Ideally, it's going to be high throughput. And of course, you're going to have deep learning detect where are the cancer cells, are they growing or not, etc. all this. Um, will be very helpful when, once the, the, the system is entirely built. I am completely out of time, so let me just conclude by saying that uh, deep learning is important and useful. It's hardly a new idea. It goes back to the 60s or the 70s in some way. Uh, I've shown you ma applications in, uh, of deep learning in the natural sciences. sciences. I think uh, there are many interesting challenges and, and, and problems there. And uh, I hope I gave you a sense that it's also interesting, uh, not only, I mean, it's interesting from a machine learning point of view because some of these problems uh, have forced us to, to, to create new architectures and, and, and new algorithms. And at least for me, most of all, you, you get to deal with problems that are uh, incredibly beautiful. Uh, for instance, this is, I, I want to leave you with a picture of the early baby universe, two billion years after the Big Bang. It's amazing that we can get such a picture where uh, what you see in red, is, this is a temperature picture take, taken from the background cosmic rot um, radiation. The, the red parts are the beginning of the galaxies before there were galaxies in, in, in the universe. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll <laughs> try to answer. Questions? So uh, with deep learning uh, in the biosciences, I imagine, especially in high throughput regimes, we're in a situation where we have a lot of tolerance for making the wrong prediction, make, making uh, false positives. Can you discuss how training deep nets under such uh, domain changes as opposed to maximum likelihood? Uh, no, uh, we can discuss this uh, over drinks if you want, but uh, I'm not going to discuss this now. Um, it was a great talk. Uh, there are, uh, you connected several threads, uh, including physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, I would like some insights on how pa hyperparameter tuning is done uh, across these different fields for deep learning. Again, the dirty laundry question. <laughs> it's the, uh, the same answer everybody does. You know, it's a combination of intuition, of uh, spending a lot of time and tuning things. There are some programs uh, like Spermint that can help you in some cases. But there is the, uh, it's an area that is certainly has not converged. So hyperparameter tuning is still a messy business, I would say. So you, you talked about applying classification regression to data sets that have been already collected. But what about experiment design and automated hypothesis generation and a truly automated scientist, ideally in a closed loop system? So people have tried, there, there is a little bit of beginning of that. People have tried robotic systems 
for testing chemicals, etc., in, in a sort of automated, fully automated scientist way where you choose your next molecule to test, etc., etc. Uh, I can't say that these uh, systems are, are working well or are you know, widely, widely used. So it's definitely a future direction, but I, I don't think we're there. So is the problem like the, the experimental hardware or the algorithms that exploring the hypothesis? I think it's both. I think we're not there. Last question. It's a very interesting talk. I think uh, there's one kind of difference between the AI uh, application of deep learning and natural science is that in AI, like vision, uh, uh, speech recognition, they have gold standard data sets. But for natural science, we, we kind of don't have that many. But uh, people, lots of people pointed out that a good, well-documented data set is a very key ingredient for deep learning to be successful. So do you think to make also standardized uh, data sets in natural science is also important? Or? So I agree that uh, data is, is uh, absolutely essential, and there is a lot of variability in the amount of data you have across sciences and across problems. So there are areas where you have a lot of data and it's well labeled, right? In, in, a part, in a high energy physics, those, the simulators are very good. So you can produce uh, 100 million examples, if you want, of the Higgs boson collisions versus uh, non-Higgs boson collisions, right? In other areas, uh, you have very few data points. So it's highly variable. Let's thank Pierre again. <laughs> so I'd also like to thank Pierre and also Porik for all of their work in organizing the symposium and thank all of you guys and our speakers for coming and giving such good talks. Uh, there's a wine and cheese reception now and as well there are posters outside if you didn't see them during lunch.